Ever since we moved into our new house, my girlfriend has been complaining about how hard the water is here. Now, I tend to be completely aloof regarding anything comfort related, so I never noticed. But this got me thinking about the chemistry of water hardness, which I'm 100% positive she loved hearing about. Now, when we discuss the relative hardness of water, what we're discussing is the concentration of certain metal ions dissolved in water, specifically the metals calcium and magnesium. Hard water has a lot of dissolved calcium and magnesium ions, while soft water has very little. This is important as over 80% of residential water in the United States is considered hard, and it can cause some problems. One of these problems is that hard water reacts with soaps and detergents in a way that makes them unable to form a smooth lather, and this might leave you feeling less clean after a shower or leave clothes feeling less soft out of the wash. Hard water will also leave spots on clean dishes as it dries and can stick to galvanized steel causing scale buildup. And this was a major problem in the early 1900s when much of the piping in homes was made of galvanized steel. But it isn't too much of an issue these days. On the other hand, the calcium and magnesium provided by drinking hard water provide numerous health benefits, and you can read about these if you're interested. I'll try to provide a link to sources if I can. Regardless, hard water can be softened before use, and this is most typically done by using an ion exchange column. These columns are packed with functionalized zeolite bound to sodium ions, and when hard water is passed through these columns, the calcium and magnesium replace the sodium ions so that the output water is simply very weak salt water. However, these things are not really cheap, so before considering buying one of these, you want to find out whether you really have hard water which is what I'm going to do today. To do this, I'm going to conduct what's called a complexometric titration, which is a type of titration used to determine the amount of metal ions dissolved in a sample. To get started, I first prepare a 0.01 molar EDTA solution by dissolving 0.372 grams of disodium EDTA dihydrate in 100 milliliters of distilled water using a volumetric flask. And this is going to be my titrant. I then prepare an indicator solution by dissolving 0.3 grams of erichrome black tea in 50 milliliters of absolute ethanol. Now I finally prepare a buffer solution by dissolving 13 grams of ammonium chloride in 50 milliliters of 30% ammonia. And this one doesn't need to be as precise as the others, so I simply use a beaker. Now that I'd mixed up my reagents, I needed to make a standard solution. The purpose of the standard solution is to give me a baseline to test my titrant against. To make this standard, I dissolved 0.148 grams of calcium hydroxide in 1000 milliliters of distilled water to make a 0.2 molar solution. Ideally, this would have been done in a volumetric flask as well, but I don't have one this big and since I don't have an analytical balance, I couldn't precisely weigh a quantity of calcium hydroxide any smaller than this. This is then allowed to completely dissolve, and then I transferred 100 milliliters of this calcium hydroxide standard to an acid-washed Erlenmeyer flask and set it up under my burette, which I filled with the EDTA titrant. I then added about 5 milliliters of my ammonium buffer solution, and this should assure that everything stays completely suspended in the solution. And lastly, I added a few drops of my Erichrome Black Tea Indicator solution, which immediately turns a wine red color indicating the presence of ions. At this point, I simply open the stopcock slightly and conduct this like a regular old titration. And what's happening here is that erichrome black tea forms a weak complex with calcium and magnesium, which turns a vibrant wine red color. However, EDTA is a very strong chelating agent and forms a much stronger complex with these ions. Because of this, EDTA will effectively steal these ions from erichrome black tea, which will be left as its deprotonated form in a weakly alkaline solution. The deprotonated form of this indicator is blue, so once all of the calcium and magnesium has bound to EDTA, the solution should turn blue, which means we've reached our endpoint. One thing to keep in mind here is that the endpoint using erichrome black tea is notoriously imprecise compared to other titration indicators and it's strongly recommended to run at least three replicates of the standards, as well as every analytical sample. However, I'm lazy and really just trying to demonstrate a concept, so I just did one test with my standard and three samples. 
Anyway, if I did everything perfectly here, the standard should have taken exactly 25 milliliters of titrant to reach the endpoint, and it took me 23.9 milliliters. This represents a negative 2.5% error, which is within the acceptable plus or minus 5% range. This indicates that I likely mixed everything well enough to get a reasonably accurate result, so I went ahead and moved on to the next step. For the next step, I run a control by adding 100 milliliters of distilled water along with 5 milliliters of the ammonium buffer and a bit of the indicator. This immediately turns blue, which shows that pure water containing no calcium or magnesium does in fact result in aerochrom black tea turning blue in solution. With my control and my standard out of the way, now it's finally time for my first sample. And for this one, I decided to just use 100 milliliters of water straight out of the tap. I added the buffer and indicator just like before and then titrated until the solution turned the same shade of blue that the standard turned. This required exactly 5.1 milliliters, which means that the water out of my tap contains a concentration of calcium and magnesium ions of around 0.00051 molar, which, if we assume most of the hardness to be calcium, this would be a concentration of 51.051 milligrams per liter. This is a reasonable assumption to make regardless of where you might live, as most water hardness does come from calcium carbonate, and water containing this concentration of calcium carbonate is considered slightly to moderately hard. Next I moved on to testing water from the tap that had not been used that day. And I did this because I heard in the past that you should let water run for a few seconds first thing in the morning as minerals affixed to the interior surface of pipes in your house will leach into the water overnight, making it a bit harder. And I wanted to see if this was true. I again processed this sample just like before, except this time I used 250 milliliters of water to see if this method still held up at a larger scale. When it had eventually completed, this one took exactly 14.6 milliliters to reach completion, which represented a molarity of 0.000584 or 58.46 milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate. This was higher than the concentration from the tap I'd been using all day, which was expected. But I honestly expected the difference between the two to be a little larger. And maybe it would be larger if I did multiple trials, but not by much. Now for my third sample, I grabbed some water from the Brita filter in the kitchen, as I was a little curious if it actually removed any hardness from water. I used 150 milliliters this time, and I apologize in advance to my old analytical chemistry professor for using different volumes of water each time, as she might have a stroke if she saw this. Remember and keep in mind that I'm doing this for fun, and changing way more parameters in real time than you ever would in an analytical laboratory. Typically, you would want to use the exact same volume of water in every trial, and you would always run several replicates, as I mentioned earlier. Anyway, to reach the endpoint for the Brita filtered water, I used 5.9 milliliters, which represents a concentration of 0.000393 molar, or 39.34 milligrams per liter. This was a more noticeable difference than I expected, considering Brita filters are not advertised or designed for removing hardness from water. So, kind of interesting. At this point, I'm done collecting data, and the next step was to use the volumes of titrant needed to reach equilibrium to calculate the concentration of calcium and magnesium carbonate in my water. I went ahead and decided to show these along the way instead of doing them all at the end, but here are my calculations if you'd like to see them. Now that I had a good idea of the concentration of calcium and magnesium in our water, I compared them to some water hardness charts I found online. And what I found is that depending on where you look, our tap water would either be considered soft or slightly hard but bordering on moderately hard. With that said, I'm honestly not sure I've ever experienced truly hard water, as I've spent most of my whole life along the east coast of the United States where water tends to be relatively soft. We did go ahead and buy the water softener for the shower anyway though, and it does seem to have made a real difference. Anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this video, or at least found it interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very, very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.